Hello and welcome to Z3 News. I'm James Bailey and today is Monday, June 1st, 2020. And today I'm continuing the discussion from the previous program regarding the primary strategy of the Roman Kingdom, the Roman Kingdom, which is very much alive and well and ruling planet Earth today, not completely yet. They're working toward that goal, but they are ruling major parts of what's happening in the world today, including the United States of America. And so on this topic of deception, it's extremely relevant to what we're uh, seeing happening in our land today because we are being bombarded with a narrative coming from the mainstream news media and from our government regarding these events happening in the cities around our nation And so I just want to point out a a statement of the obvious to many of you, but just the fact that things are not what they appear to be. The information we're being told is not true. This has been a pattern that's repeated throughout history of our nation as well as the world, but our government has lied to us repeatedly, and the news media is totally controlled by uh, the people that control the government. But our heads have been so indoctrinated with so many lies that when someone comes and tries to explain the truth, we can't process it. It's just like, no, no, can't, no, no, that you're, you're a fool if you think that. And it's really... Uh, presents a challenge because the only people I think that can hear uh, what I'm trying to share are the people that are humble enough to understand that they don't already know it all, they don't already have it all figured out, that we need um, to seek after and be open to hear the truth. And along those lines, I've set my my, um, guides are, number one, the Bible. I mean, I know that sounds radical, but we're supposed to believe the Bible, aren't we? I mean, it's just amazing to me how many Christians just completely disregard the Bible, but yet will listen for hours to some anonymous source called Q. Are you kidding me? We are living in enemy-occupied territory, and you're going to put your trust in an anonymous source? Meanwhile... The Bible is filled with insights explaining what's happening in our world today, and I have shared a lot of that in the previous programs. So if you missed those, I would encourage you to go back and listen to them because I don't have time to do it again. But then my second guide is the witness of the Holy Spirit, the dreams and visions and revelations that the Holy Spirit gives, and I shared in previous programs about how he gave me a dream in 2014, and he's given me many, many different dreams over the years. But that was a major one because it, it showed that there was a scheme to murder the American people, and it's being orchestrated by our own government, not by some foreign power, but from within. And at the time, it made no sense at all to me. But it makes perfect sense according to the scriptures because the Bible reveals in Revelation chapter 18 that this woman, this mother of all harlots, this mystery Babylon, is responsible for all who are slain upon the earth. That's an enormous insight. That's in the Bible. It contradicts everything we've been taught in our history lessons in school. We haven't heard a peep about this but yet it's right there in the Bible. And this same one we find throughout history has been waging war, endless war. This is that spirit of that rider on the white horse who goes forth conquering and to conquer. And who is it that that spirit is conquering? Anyone who opposes it. And that is what is called heretics, according to the Roman Catholic Church. And now even to make mention of such a thing causes people's minds to get blown. Like, what could you be saying? I'm saying what the Bible's saying. I'm saying what Daniel chapter 2 
Daniel chapter 9, Revelation chapter 13, many other scriptures pointing to Rome. Rome has always been the one. And if you study history, it's always been Rome. For the past 2,000 plus years, it's been Rome. And guess who it's going to be in the remaining years that we have before the Lord returns? Yeah, it's going to be Rome. It's not that complicated. It's just that we've got to connect the dots and believe the scriptures and believe the warnings that God's giving us and begin to uh, study these things out so that we can know with confidence. And that's why I'm presenting this stuff. That's why I want people to understand the background of who are these people and what happened to the Catholic Church. And that's why I was sharing in the previous program that they were completely taken over by the year 1814. They were the victims of their own darkness that they, re when the Protestant Reformation came in 1517, and the Catholic Church took a hard stand, despite the fact that very eloquent uh, leaders of the Protestant Reformation explained the scriptures to them, they rejected it because it went against their own authority, and they chose to have their own authority. And they were already, at that point, they, had, they were the instigators of the Crusades. They were the instigators of the Inquisitions. They had committed terrible crimes against humanity. They had mass murdered many thousands of Christians, including others who were not Christians, but pagans and Muslims. And, of course, the Jews. They have relentlessly, nonstop persecuted the Jews for thousands of years. And they continue doing so today. But they have been on this crusade for centuries. But when they rejected the light of the gospel at the time of the Reformation, they gave birth to a monster, a hideous beast. And this is the very spirit, the very embodiment of this spirit of the beast that is come upon the world. This is the spirit of Antichrist that has come upon the world. And it has come through this organization that was founded and approved by the Pope in the year 1540. And this is called the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. And this is the thing that we have to understand because we're being bombarded with so many lies. Our heads are filled with so many lies. And I've compared it previously to like those guys in the in the weight room who only work on building up their arms and their chest and they're so enamored with themselves they look at themselves in the mirror and see how how big their upper body has gotten that they fail to see that they're standing on little toothpick legs because they neglect working out their legs and that's just like we've been because we've We've uh, neglected history. We've, we've become so easily deceived. And our forefathers were not like that. You can go back and study them. Men like Abraham Lincoln warned about the Jesuits. Men like President John Adams warned. and He said that in the year 1814, the world went into deep darkness because the Jesuits were reinstated. And not only were they reinstated, but they became the heads of the church. They became rulers over the popes. Through the superior general of the Society of Jesus, they rule the popes since 1814. And this beast that the Catholic Church gave birth to first went about just about wrecking the Catholic Church. They were expelled from 83 countries because of their evil plots to murder heretic kings whom they called heretics because heretic to them is anyone not under their thumb. Prior to that, a heretic had been anyone not submitted to the Pope. But the Jesuits took it even further and said it's anyone who's not submitted to the Jesuits because they had their own head who was different from the Pope. And this evil beast, uh, after just about wrecking the Catholic Church, the Pope in 1773 had no choice but to issue a bull suppressing the society, uh, telling them they had no more right to exist. And he didn't want to do it because he knew, like previous popes before him, that it could cost him his life. 
In fact, before him, 11 other popes had issued uh, decrees, bulls, uh, trying to suppress and uh, rein in the Jesuits because they knew they were trouble. They knew it was dangerous to even issue a statement against them. And so did the kings of, of nations around the world. And so what happened was the Jesuits in 1773 were suppressed by the Pope. And just as he feared, it did cost him his life, just as it had cost the previous Pope his life. And I'm referring to Pope Clement XIII, who on the very day that he was meeting uh, with his college of advisors, his cardinals, uh, to discuss what to do regarding the Jesuits and was considering this very thing of taking action against them, on that very day he fell dead of poisoning, which is a trademark method of assassination used by the Jesuits. So it fell upon the next pope, and that was Pope Clement the Fourteenth, and no sooner had he issued his bull suppressing the Jesuits, it wasn't long after that, that he was poisoned too, except the Jesuits gave him a different kind of poisoning because they wanted him to die an extremely painful and slow death. And so the whole process took 14 months from the time that he issued that decree to the time of his death. And during that time, he suffered terribly. And the Jesuits went on after that and murdered the next pope as well, because there's absolutely nothing they won't do to regain power for themselves. There's no limit to their moral depravity. There's no limit to what extent that they will go to accomplish their goal. And that's actually one of the reasons why they've been so successful, because it says in Genesis chapter 11, referring to those people that built the Tower of Babel, that they were of one mind, and nothing would be impossible for them, because they were in agreement in what they sought to do. And that's the way the Jesuits operate. They are in complete agreement. They are all of one mind, completely submitted to their superior general. And that's the way the organization was set up by Ignatius Loyola. It was all designed to operate by complete domination over everyone that belongs to the organization. Every thought, word, and deed is under the complete control of the superior general. I mean, they are a machine. They are a militant organization, a militant organization that wears not armor and not swords, but the garments of priests. And there you see the picture of deception. They are not what they appear to be, but they are deadly and they are well trained in their, their warfare. And so there's a lot more details to this story that I'll be getting into later. But this is the, the um, time of, that they were separated from the Catholic Church from 1773 to 1814. During that time is when they uh, formed the Illuminati. And that's also the time in 1782 that they connected with the Rothschilds, with Mayor Amschel Rothschild. And so he became a very important part of their future. But by 1814, they were reinstated, and no pope would dare to stand against them. And there were many popes after that that were not Jesuits, but yet they had Jesuit confessors. And a confessor is a priest who hears your daily uh, confessions, your most private and personal um, confessions of what you're dealing with. And so the superior general has a designated Jesuit who hears the confessions of the Pope, and they know everything about what the Pope is doing and thinking, and they have completely controlled all the Popes until this latest Pope, Pope Francis, is actually an outright open Jesuit, the first one who is... Uh, just openly Jesuit. It's a complete takeover. And they don't even try to hide it anymore, and they don't need to because they've been so successful in deceiving the whole world about what's happening. Nobody is even talking about them anymore. 
But I like to use the analogy, if you think of the Roman Catholic Church as a computer system, you could say that in the year 1540, they were infected with a terrible virus. And this virus was wreaking havoc throughout the system, deleting files, rewriting files, and causing all sorts of trouble. And they tried everything they could do to purge the system of this virus, but they couldn't. And so ultimately, they had to shut the machine down and wipe out the operating system and install a new one. That's what happened in 1814 when that computer was rebooted with this new operating system. It was a Jesuit system. And it has been ever since. And so what my goal is for these programs is to provide you with the truth about what's happening in the world today. Who cares, right? Who cares what happened in the past unless it it helps us understand the present and the future. And it does because it's in the study of the past that we find out what's operating in the world today through the Jesuits. And the patterns of history show that the same spirit has operated over this organization from the very beginning, from the time of their founder, Ignatius Loyola, and his own flawed beliefs about God, his own flawed beliefs about how to get close to God by punishing himself, by whipping himself, by torturing himself to pay for his own sins, which is, as, as the Bible reveals, it's called self-righteousness. It's like filthy rags to God. It doesn't count as righteousness because it's, it's all about self. There's no faith in God. We're saved only by our faith and not by our works. And so any kind of attempts like that to to bring yourself into right alignment with God by your own punishment of yourself is going to fail, and it did fail. But Loyola became the first superior general of the Society of Jesus, and he required everyone to submit completely to him in every way, every thought even, everything that they did, had to be submitted to him. And he even wrote into the Jesuit constitution that the superior general is to be obeyed as Christ Jesus the Lord. And that's a direct quote from the Jesuit constitution. I'm showing it here on the screen. The candidate must regard the superior as Christ the Lord and must strive to acquire perfect resignation and denial of his own will and judgment in all things, conforming his will and judgment to that which the superior wills and judges. And this, I believe, is the key to understanding this organization. They are not allowed to have anything of themselves. It's all about coming under the complete control of the superior general. And it's extremely dangerous to submit to someone else like that, to have someone else have control over you. It's extremely dangerous to uh, lay down your own good judgment, your own uh, understanding of what's right and wrong, to deny your own conscience, just to trust that this other person is going to tell you the right thing to do. And as a result, you come up with Jesuits doing the most horrible crimes because they've convinced themselves that they can do anything as long as the superior general tells them to. It must be the right thing to do because he said so. And so they uh, are trained in this way. And that's why they're so incredibly dangerous. And here is a quote showing what they're required. It says, The warnings of conscience are to be suppressed as culpable weaknesses. The fears of eternal punishment banished from the thoughts as superstitious fancies, and the most heinous crimes, when committed by command of the general, are to be regarded as promoting the glory and praise of God. And so what we see is this spirit that controls this evil system is all about 
total control. And this is the spirit that's behind what we call the New World Order. It's completely authoritarian. It's dictatorial. It's domineering. And it wants total control. And this has been from the very beginning. This is how the Jesuits started. And this is how they've operated. Everywhere they went, it was the same story. So when the Jesuits send missionaries to other countries, they go with a specific goal in mind that they want total control over that entire nation. And they do whatever they have to do to bring that to pass. And that includes assassinating the leaders, if need be, or assassinating anyone else who stands in their way. They'll call on popes to excommunicate people that don't seem to be coming under their spell so that those people will lose influence. But two of their primary strategies are to go in to set up school systems so they can begin to influence the thinking, influence what goes into our mind. It's a form of mind control. And then a second part of their strategy is to pursue the knowledge of what's being thought by the rulers of the land. And so they, time after time and nation after nation, they seek to gain influence in the inner circle of the leaders and the families of the leaders. And ideally, they like to be to gain their trust that they can operate as the personal confessor, the personal advisor to these people so that they can hear everything they're thinking and have influence over them because ultimately they want it to be that every major decision is, is uh, that they have influence and control over every major decision that's happening until such time that they can actually get their person, their ideal person who is willing to do whatever they want to get that person in the head position. And then they can really begin to implement all the changes that they want to make to make the place completely Jesuit-friendly. And by Jesuit-friendly, I mean submitted to the will of the superior general in the same way that they themselves are. And so it was with these strategies that they went and sent missionaries into many different nations and Everywhere they went, they caused great trouble by their practices, trouble for the Catholic Church, as well as trouble for the people in the lands where they went. And for instance, in England, they arrived in the year 1580. In 10 years prior to that, the Pope had issued a bull excommunicating Queen Elizabeth because she supported the Protestant Reformation. And so England at that time was largely a Protestant nation. And so when the Jesuits arrived, they came in under false pretense. And that is another common trait among the Jesuits. They are willing to do anything they have to do, and they will blend themselves into any culture, into any nation, to make themselves appear to be what they are not. And so they overcome barriers of resistance and do whatever it takes to achieve their ultimate purpose. And in the case of England, they had their sights set on the queen. They wanted to assassinate the queen. And within one year, three Jesuits were publicly executed for trying to kill the queen. And that happened in 1581. And that situation there was summarized by the author Giovanni Battista Nicolini in his book, History of the Jesuits, which was published in 1854. And by the way, you can get a free copy of it on Gutenberg's website. I think it's gutenberg.com. But they offer all these old books as ebooks for free. And it's an excellent copy. It's very clean. Um, that's the one I'm using, and I like it a lot. But Nicolini summarized 
what was happening there in England and gives an excellent insight in this statement. It says, Intoxicated with admiration of the divine power and infallibility of the Pope, Pope Pius V, referring to his excommunication bull, says, They revered his bull from 1570, by which he excommunicated and deposed the queen, Elizabeth I, and some of them had gone to that height of extravagance as to assert that the performance had been immediately dictated by the Holy Ghost. And he goes on to explain the assassination of heretical sovereigns and of that princess in particular was represented as the most meritorious of all enterprises and they taught that whoever perished in such attempts enjoyed without dispute the glorious and never-fading crown of martyrdom. And so that's why these Jesuits are willing to come into the nation and lay down their life to kill the queen. They believed that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit to do so. That's how deceived they were. They are still to this day. This is how they think. And they further think that they themselves will receive a great reward in eternity for being willing to lay down their lives in the quest to murder foreign rulers. And what they did in England was just one among many examples that show the same pattern of behavior everywhere they went. For example, in France, they encountered resistance entering the country similar to what they would have encountered in England if they had been honest about who they were. But the French were concerned because the Jesuits uh, were not submitted to French law. They were only submitted to the dominion of the Pope and, of course, the superior general. And so they saw that that was potential for trouble and told them that the terms for them entering their nation were, number one, you could not uh, be Jesuits. You could not operate as Jesuits. And number two, you had to uh, take an oath uh, agreeing to the fact that the Pope uh, does not have authority over the King of France or over other authorities in France, but the French have that authority. And you would think that those two requirements would have been a deal breaker for the Jesuits, but no, this is what this is the pattern. This is what they do. They will take an oath. They will do whatever. They will change their uh, belief system. They will change their uh, appearance. They will change their the way they conduct their their religious services. They will do whatever they have to do to morph in, to come in and infiltrate that place. And so they were allowed to enter because they took that oath. Because the Jesuits believe that taking an oath is meaningless if at the time that you're taking it, you are thinking that you don't mean what you're saying. And I'm not just saying that because that's my opinion. I'm saying that because that was the findings of Nicolini in his book, The History of the Jesuits. And so they agreed to those terms and they were allowed to enter France. And guess what happened? they ignited a war of religion against the Protestants. And that war started in 1562, just two years after they entered, and it continued for the next 36 years. And during that time, the Jesuits helped instigate one of the greatest massacres of Protestants in the history of France, what's called the St. Bar- Bartholomew massacre, and that was in the year 1572. And they formed alliances with other Catholics who were radical in their thinking as they were. And this was, they called a holy alliance. It's also called the Catholic League. And this group, their goal was to overthrow the King of France, which was Henry III, because in their view, Henry was too lenient, too tolerant of the Protestants, who were known as Huguenots. 
And so they sought to overthrow the government. You see the same pattern of what they did in England. They want to overthrow the government to put someone in power that's more to their liking. And so they instigated a revolt against King Henry III. And by 1589, they succeeded in assassinating him. But when Henry III was succeeded by Henry IV, they didn't like him either. And meanwhile, this war of religion continued. But Henry IV brought an end to it after 36 years by issuing an edict. It's called the Edict of Nantes. And what it did was it decreed that the Protestants were perfectly legal in their exercise of the Protestant faith in practicing the Protestant faith. And this edict permitted them to continue doing so. So this really outraged the Jesuits. And they conspired and they continued to conspire until they finally got their way. And in the year 1610, just 12 years after the Edict of Nantes was issued, they succeeded in assassinating Henry IV. And so I'm pointing these things out because this is the way they operated from the very beginning. These were the very early years of the Jesuits, but this kind of behavior continued for decade after decade and in nation after nation. And so by the time you get to the year 1773, the the Catholic Church was facing a revolt among their uh, the nations and the kings that were trying to uh, show their submissiveness to the Pope. They couldn't take it anymore. They had to have relief. Either the Pope had to ban the Jesuits or they're going to be done with the Pope. So the practices of the Jesuits was so hideous that it threatened to destroy the entire Roman Catholic Church and all their power bases throughout the world. And so... Finally, Pope Clement XIV issued the bull to dissolve, suppress the Jesuits and forbid them from continuing to exist, but it didn't stop them. They just regrouped. They just retreated to safe havens in areas where the bull was not enforced. And they came up with a plan, and this is the plan that ultimately got them back on top. And that's going to be the topic of my upcoming podcast in which I'll be sharing the details of how they totally turned the tables with the help of the Rothschilds. And the reason why I believe their patterns of behavior are so vitally important for us to understand today is because we're seeing these same patterns of behavior repeating in our time. Our United States government is the vehicle through which the Jesuits have gone throughout the nations of the world doing exactly the same thing they've done from the beginning, overthrowing foreign governments. And they're using the resources of the United States of America to do this. And I know that might surprise a lot of people to hear that. It might sound so odd, but it's why I was saying earlier in the program that our minds have been so indoctrinated with so many lies and the truth has been hidden from us for so long that we, when we finally hear the truth, it's shocking. It's like, what the heck are you talking about? It's hard to digest, hard to process, but it's still the truth. And I'm going to be, in these upcoming programs, I'm going to be helping you to connect those dots so you can see exactly how these pieces fell into place and how we got to where we are today. And as we think it through, think through all the implications of what this means, it's enormous. It's totally staggering to think about how this changes our perspective of what's happening in the world today. But one thing I can tell you for sure What's not happening is what we're hearing reported day in and day out. Okay, well, I think that's a good place to stop for today. 
So thanks for joining me today, and I hope to be back again soon with another program. Until then, so long.